You are listening to Middle East Monitor Conversations, bringing you lively discussions with prominent voices from the region and beyond as we delve deeper into issues shaping the Middle East and North Africa, from politics to culture and the arts. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Memo in Conversation with podcast. I'm Alexander Morris. I'm a video producer and documentary maker. And we're here today with Hisham al Omezi. He is a conflict analyst. Um, he's currently based in Washington, D.C., but has been in and out of Yemen throughout the conflict um, and has been you know, following the peace negotiations that have been taking place uh, over the last week. Hisham, if we could just start uh, by talking about what's happened most recently. So last week in Sana'a and with the, the prisoner swaps, could you just give us a, a quick breakdown on your views on, on, on what's, what's just happened? Well, we've had the second largest prisoner swap last week, over the weekend, uh, which was indicative of uh, some progress in the peace process in Yemen. And of course, when I say, when I say the peace process, uh, I'm, I mean uh, the overarching roadmap that has been in discussion for the past almost, what, eight years since the beginning of the conflict, with not much of a progress the thing is, uh, now the Saudis, with the direct talks with the Houthis, have kind of restarted that process. There was a limbo in that process. But uh, uh, the thing is, a lot of people are conflating the Saudi-Houthi talks with an end to the Yemeni conflict. Uh, people tend to forget that the Yemeni conflict is very complex. It's multi-layered. It's multi-party conflict. It's not just between the Houthis and the Saudis. So even if the regional conflict, the regional aspect of the conflict ends with the Saudis' involvement in Yemen and their battle with the Houthis, that does not necessarily mean it's going to bring about an end to the multiple internal conflicts inside the country. That will take a while, especially when the current peace process that I just mentioned earlier is not all-inclusive yet. Uh, Even the UN process... uh, uh, was largely focused between the Yemeni government and the Houthis when over the course of the past eight years uh, there have been multiple additional factions entering the ring. Uh, the Southern Transitional Council is a good example of that. Uh, and they have control, normal control of the temporary capital in Aden. So that they cannot just be ignored. They cannot be, just be marginalized. They're a powerful player on the board. Uh, you have the national resistance on the Western coast as well. That's another powerful player on the board. You have the other parties, local parties on the ground and tribal parties on the ground as well. And places like that is you have multiple factions in control of bits and parts of the city. You have to bring those people to the negotiating table as well. So it's, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a bit superficial and it's a bit uh, overly simplistic for people to think that even the current talks are going to bring about an end to the Yemeni conflict. People need to start asking questions uh, such as, what is the Yemeni conflict? How many layers does the Yemeni conflict have? What are the roots of that conflict? Are those things being addressed? Uh, so far, we don't have a holistic, comprehensive, and deep enough process to resolve all those issues. So the so yeah, let's just break that down a bit. So when we talk about the Yemeni conflict, as you say, it's multi-layered. If if we're talking about an end in the first instance to, for example, the involvement of the Saudi-led coalition mm-hmm. in having you know airstrikes, boots on the ground, these sorts of things, can could that be achieved through these talks in the first instance? Yes, uh, I believe what you're referring to is the ceasefire, uh, basically between the Saudi-led uh, coalition and the Houthis, and that has been in effect for, for the past few months. The thing is, that did not bring an end to the fighting on the ground. Uh, Houthis are still pushing in places like Shabwa and Marib. There's been fighting on the western coast skirmishes. There's been fighting in places like 
Adara in the south and in places like Taz. So while on that level, at that layer, as you just said, we could be help, hopeful and it will be really helpful for the Saudi-led coalition to seize, for instance, the airstrikes and the Saudis seizing the cross-border attacks and sending ballistic missiles to Aram, places like Aramco installations. Again, what does that mean to Yemenis? There are 30 million people uh, held hostage to this conflict and suffering from the internal fighting inside the country. Did we bring about a ceasefire inside the country? Not yet. Can we see can we see a sliver of hope coming for for those people that you mentioned? And yeah. and at this point, it would be good just to paint a picture of what has been called by many people as the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Um, what, yes, we can. What is the day? What is the daily reality for Yemenis at the minute? Okay, especially in the, the, the where the where the conflict is 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 raging, still raging, or has been. There is hope. I mean, even the the ceasefire agreement, even though it was not a complete ceasefire, there was a lot of de-escalation. Let's be honest here. There was a lot of de-escalation, and there was a bit of an improvement in this in the status quo inside the country. The thing is that a lot of people we're hoping for more after eight years of this back and forth uh, and uh, management of expectations should have been done in a much better uh, way when people introduce the current process uh, in terms in terms of the humanitarian situation on the ground it's very devastating you're talking about almost uh, more than 80% of the population in need of some form of aid. That's about 22 million people. And two thirds of the population who are food insecure. 50% of our hospitals are not functional. And the ones that are still in operation are barely functional. Uh, we lack clean water, electricity, uh, the rate of unemployment has skyrocketed, as you can imagine, because of the war. Uh, there was a lot of capital flight. The infrastructure has been devastated. So people uh, were basically lost their jobs. And when you go to the public sector, salaries have stopped being paid for the longest time. And this is why that's one of the main issues in the negotiations is the payment of public salaries. Because although it's very little, it's still a lifeline to a lot of families inside the country. Now, the situation, the humanitarian situation kept getting worse over the past eight years. Aid could not keep up. Not only that, but solutions that have been introduced to Yemen were not sustainable. So you ended up in this situation where each year there's exceeding demands and uh, programs and projects that are catching up to that. And on top of all of it, Aid has been cut down in the last year. A lot of aid has been diverted to Ukraine. Uh, a lot of governments uh, have had to deal with COVID ramifications. So they cut the aid to Yemen. So the situation just got worse and it will get worse. Uh, a few months ago, <clears throat> there was a donor conference just to fund one year's plan in Yemen, one year's UN plan in Yemen. And we couldn't even raise half the funding required. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very desperate situation, honestly. This is one of the reasons, for instance, when we were discussing about the existence of uh, child soldiers, child brides, and a lot of people are joining the fronts. It's not because of the ideology. It's not because of the uh, 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 ignorance. It's because of poverty. Mm. A lot of people are trying to put bread on their tables. They're mm. trying to feed their families. So when these fighting parties come to me and they say, Here's $50 per month, which is a lot in Yemen. Here's $50 per month. Why don't you join the fight? Here's an AK-47. Even if I'm not politically invested, I need to feed my family, so I'll go and fight. Yeah. And, and what are you hearing from friends, family, other people uh, in Yemen about access to things like medicine, basic medicines, water, food, you know, how... How easy or hard is it 
for people on, on that sort of level? It, it depends. It depends where you are inside the country. Uh, and some areas are very desolate. Uh, and in places like Hodeida and places like Hajja, it's extremely difficult. And especially in areas where there are IDPs, we have almost 4 million IDPs in Yemen. That's huge. Internally displaced people. Yes, the internally displaced people. So it, it's really desperate in those camps and the IDP camps. Uh, inside cities, it's it's a bit better. But the thing is, it's a bit, now because of the, the war economy, it's a very kind of pyramid-like economy. So you have people at the top who can afford things and things are available, are made, being made available to them. But the majority of the people cannot afford medicine, cannot afford gas, cannot afford clean water. And uh, for instance, and I remember this is one of the things why the Houthis were quite upset with me back at the time when I started exposing these inequalities, this, this injustice inside Sana'a. Mm. And I remember people calling me and saying, newspapers and news outlets calling and saying, we hear about the humanitarian crisis in, in Yemen and brink of famine. That means there's virtually no food in Yemen. And I, and I remember taking my camera and showing the people that I'm like, there, there is food on the shelves in these groceries, in these upscale areas. But the thing is, 95 to 98% of the population cannot afford that. Yeah. It's only very few handful of families and uh, this elite strata of people that yeah. can afford it. And they're usually Houthis. And you, you go down the street and you can, you can see a Porsche being driven by a Houthi or uh, the latest Range Rover or a Rolls Royce. Mm. While... while uh, the majority of the population cannot even afford gas. Yeah, yeah, they've already yeah. sold the, ca the cars. They've already, uh, uh, well, they can't even afford transportation. <laughs> They're walking on foot. Mm -hmm. Because of the disparity, and I was trying to highlight that disparity, and the, 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 because there was a lot of misinformation back at the time during the war, uh, people didn't realize that it's not just a lack of resources but it's because of the systemic corruption nepotism that has been going on inside the country. And if we're being completely honest, because also of the mismanagement of aid money by uh, of donor money by aid organizations inside the country. Yeah. yeah. And if, if we if we just come now to um, what happened last month in terms of this is re-establishing of relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran, um, brokered by China, but uh, by all accounts. Um, what did you make of that situation? Were you surprised? Not really, to be honest, I wasn't. The thing is, Saudis have been on a path of de-escalation uh, for the past, uh, well, since the end of last year. Remember how they reached out to Syria, they, how they reached out to Turkey, they reached out to Qatar. So they've been mending their bridges. And they've been moving east instead of west. They've been in talks with Russia. They've been in talks with China. They've been improving their relationships. So to us in the Arab region, that didn't come as a surprise. And I remember a lot of people in the West are like, oh, how dare they? Did they actually do that? And we're like, what did you expect? Yeah. I mean, you could not contain them. You could not mend those bridges. So they went east. And... Even when they mended the bridges with Iran, it was inevitable. No war goes on forever. And they yeah. realized that for their own peace of mind, for, the, for their own um, sustainable future, they needed to put out all these fires around them. And they started doing that, which is wise, honestly. And part of what they're doing in Yemen basically is part of that policy. Uh, they, they're seeking an exit strategy out of Yemen. Yemen has been Saudi's Vietnam. It's been a quagmire, a quicksand for them. So they've, they've been trying to extricate themselves out of Yemen. And they've been making a lot of concessions towards that end. That's why you've seen the Saudis come all the way to Sana'a mm -hmm. and willing to extend the olive branch to the Houthis. And when the Houthis, some of their concessions were a bit over the top, the Saudis still were willing to furnish those requests, payment of salaries by the Saudis, lifting of all import restrictions of Hudaydah, 
opening of the ports in Sana, the airport in Sana, and even completely marginalizing the issues in Taiz, which is a priority that has been a pub, there's been a public outcry to deal with Taiz and the siege in Taiz. But again, that issue has been, you know what, dropped down the priority list just for the sake of striking a deal with the Houthis. Mm. Now, of course, as you can imagine, this did not make a lot of people happy inside Yemen because Houthis are not Yemen. A lot of people were left twiddling their thumbs in the past years and thinking, what about us? Does this mean legitimizing the Houthis? Does that mean that the Yemeni government will never return to Sana'a? Does that mean that now for people who live in Sana'a, it's going to be the prevalent status quo is going to be the reality. There's going to be an international recognition of the Houthis and we'll have to live under their rule for the next 20 to 30 years. We're going we're gonna to get to that. That's a very, very important part of the conversation. Um, what I wanted to ask was, I, I found what you said very interesting back there, um, because for people that haven't been watching closely, they might have been surprised by how quickly it went from um, the establishing of relations between Saudi and Iran to these you know, limited peace negotiations, let's call them. Um, but you say this has been a long time coming. The Saudis have wa- been wanting to get out of Yemen for quite a quite a long time. Yeah, they have been. I mean, I remember, I remember the beginning of the conflict. The Saudis were like, we'll be in and out within a few weeks, destroy the Houthis, pick them out of Sana'a, and we'll get to celebrate victory by, by midsummer. That did not happen to a lot of us in Yemen when we heard those statements, we were laughing because this wasn't our first rodeo in Yemen. We've had multiple wars in just the past few decades. We know um, we've had the Egyptians come into Yemen and thinking they could score a victory and leave. We've had wars with Saudis across border wars in the past as well. And we've had internal civil wars. We know how long they can drag and we know our capabilities. So when the Saudis said that, and we were like, we're not just skeptical, we're laughing, honestly. And I remember being on TV back at the time and thinking, yeah, that's not going to happen. And I was telling the world that it would be near impossible for the Saudis to just beat him and throw an aerial bombardment campaign. And if they would uh, try to push on the ground, they'd be slaughtered. Yemenis are excellent fighters. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to brag as a Yemeni, but we're really, really, really good fighters, and we know our terrain. There's a lot of guns in Yemen, isn't there? There's a lot of guns, and I mean, my gift when I was when I was 12 years old was a gun, <laughs> and when, by by 14 and 16, you really know how to use an AK-47. You're really good at it. I think, yeah, there's more guns per capita than, than any country. Something like yep. That. Yep. We're only second to the U.S. Okay. And, and speaking of the U.S., um, uh, noticeably not very present in anything that's been happening over the last few months on the surface anyway. They, they have been, but not over the last few weeks. I wouldn't say the last few months. Yeah. Because uh, the Saudis kind of pulled the rug from underneath everyone with the Houthis outreach. And not even the UN uh, was aware of brought into. I remember the, reading a statement by the UN saying, we, we, we were aware, we weren't involved, but we were aware, which gives you an indication that they weren't really consulted. I mean, the Saudis at the end of the day called the shots. They, uh, they, 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 they're the puppet masters. Uh, in, in this ordeal and I remember back at the time when the UN was doing consultations before the announcing of the PLC and the Saudis within, within I think it was within like 12 or 48 or 24 hours they just called everybody and they're like you know what we'll do our own parallel consultations to Riyadh everybody come in and they sent tickets and they sent flights and everybody just showed up in Riyadh and within uh yeah, 48 hours after that, they announced the Presidential Leadership Council. Mm-hmm. 
completely marginalizing the, the UN and the effort. Mm. And they did it again now. So while the UN, what they're doing is very much appreciated. The Saudis, and I know that everybody, it's about keeping up appearances. And the Saudis, of course, there's always this uh, this public uh, presence or public image that they're trying to project that everything is done in tandem. Not really. The Saudis are doing their own thing. They will let you know later on, a later stage, but after uh, they've already secured an agreement or done whatever there is, uh, they needed to do. But going back, going back to to the to the Iran and uh, Yemeni conflict, this is one of the issues that we've always talked about uh, early on during the conflict was that Saudi has always publicized the fight as a fight against Iran inside Yemen. And when they said uh, we're 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 coming in to destroy Iran's capabilities in Sana, and everybody was like. By the way, we are south of the border. Iran is north of the border. If you have an issue with Iran, just direct your missiles at 180 degrees and just fire it off to the north. <laughs> so, so, so you don't have to punish us for what the Houthis are doing. And uh, if you have something to sort out with the Iranians, just deal with them directly. But it was, of course, it was cheaper, it was less risky. Uh, and Yemen was, has always been a petri dish for resolving um, regional conflicts. So they did that. And uh, the Saudis, within the first year, of course, they wanted to flex their muscles. They thought it was doable. And of course, there were people inside Yemen, including the Yemeni government, who told them, of course you can. We'll guide you through the process of defeating the Houthis. And uh, they failed within the first few months. Then the first year, then the second year, and it kept dragging on and on and on. And after a few years, the Saudis started to question their own generals. If you remember, if the Saudis also fired their own generals, it's not just Yemeni generals, and they changed the government twice, and they replaced a lot of military generals, and they, it still wasn't fixable. They were still being drained out of resources. And just last year, they were, they were like, that's enough. We need to start cutting our losses. Because the way it's been going on, it's, it's as like we've been pulling in a lot of resources and pouring it into Yemen with zero results. And that's when you started to hear a lot of people saying, oh, it just, it's a military and political deadlock. There's no military solution to the current conflict. Uh, everybody needs to sit around the table. I'm like, we've been saying that since the beginning of the conflict. But nobody will listen to us. Instead, Everybody joined the coalition. Everybody was funding one side or the other. Everybody was happy to sell weapons. And you just made your buck, you made your money. And now that there's no money to be made, everybody is like, you know, let's call it quits. I mean, it's, it's sad. It's, it's a sad, sad, sad reality, but there are a lot of drivers to the current conflict, and a lot of people assume that it's just, just local. No, it's regional. There's international interest as well. And everybody had an agenda. Yeah. I don't mean to just internationalize the conflict, but everybody had an agenda in Yemen. And, and so what about in these, in these talks that have happened last week, brokered by or at least observed by an Amani delegation. Um, do you know which points are going to be discussed in, in these negotiations specifically? Yeah. I mean, one of the main issues that are being discussed there is, of course, ending the cross-border attacks, but also providing guarantees. And the other thing is lifting all forms of restrictions and rehabilitating the court infrastructure. Also, what's being discussed is issues um, uh, relating to power sharing, but also resources sharing and taxation, because the Houthis want their hand in the honey pot. So they want, they're discussing revenues, not just in the areas under the control, but also in areas under the government's control, specifically places like Nile. They want revenues from there as well. And with, but having said that, 
the Saudis, yes, they have the upper hand. Yes, they can commit to things and force the Yemeni government to make those concessions and commit to those as well, or use the Yemeni government as rubber stamp. But the thing is, that would be really problematic because as soon as you step out of the room, Saudi, people will start fighting inside the room. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Yemen here. People will start fighting internally. People will not accept uh, a model where they basically pay levies and taxes to the Houthis just to appease the Houthis. It's completely imbalanced, that power relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, of course, the Houthis will continue to be brutal. They'll continue to be unjust. And because they feel that they, they have the upper hand, they will further, I mean, human rights violations are going to continue. Um, there's going to be silencing of dissent. But they will also seek an expansionist agenda. It will not stop in Sana'a. They will want to control Madam. They will want to, they will want to go down south as well. They will want to control of Hudaydah. They will want to evict uh, the forces in the western coast. They want to go to do, down to Bala and Aden as well. They want to move east towards Al Mahra, towards Shabwa. And they have shown signs of doing that over the past few months when they tried to take some of the governor, some of the districts in, in Shabwa. So without measures to keep the Houthis in check, without guarantees that as soon as a deal is signed to just stop the cross-border attacks, Houthis will turn inwards and start attacking uh, local parties, we won't have a peace deal. Mm. I mean, let's call it what it is. It's a border agreement between the Saudis and the, uh, and the Houthis. Yeah. And because, you know, eventually what needs to happen is some sort of roadmap for uh, people to govern someone or some formation of, of or coalition to govern the country. Um, yes. and, and I think it would be a good point now to, between us, just quickly thrash out for maybe younger listeners or people that don't know so much about the conflict, who are the key parties there? And I'll quickly, I'll quickly go through it and then you correct me if I get anything wrong. Um, sure. So we have the Houthis who, at the minute, they control the north of the country. What was North Yemen? In theory, you know, backed by Iran, um, in terms of weapons and and money and mm -hmm. other things, um, we have the the Yemeni government or the internationally recognised Yemeni government in in alliance with an Arab coalition, Saudi led Arab coalition of mm -hmm. um, authors, um, and then we have some other players. You you mentioned the Southern Successionist um, mm -hmm. who. Are they in Aden at the moment, or are they sort of around Aden? In Aden, in Abien, in Abien and parts of around Aden, the Southern Transitional Council. Southern Transitional Council. Um, other groups, ISIS is there? Not not big. ISIS is not big in Yemen. Baghdad is there. But you also have the, the national resistance on the western coast. You have some uh, tribal confederations in the east. Uh, and you, you have, of course, a faction in Marib, of the Yemeni military and the Islah party faction in Marib as well. So it's uh, this is why it, it gets it can quickly get really complicated once you start to draw uh, a list of how many factions there are in Yemen. But to to slightly simplify it, who should be at the table? Who do you think are the key players here that should be at the table? At the very least. The Western Coast Forces, the Southern Transitional um, Council, uh, the Marib uh, tribal leaders, Taz represented from Taz, since so Taz has been hard hit by the by the conflict, and of course, if we move to for, towards the east, we need the Mahris and the Sokatris as well to be uh, uh, at the table. Yeah, and can and do you think before we really go into it? I was thinking about the Iraq conflict. The, mm -hmm. the, 
conflict. So it was it was an, it was an, a war by the Americans. They invaded Iraq. When it was um, twenty years on now from from the beginning of the invasion, but what, when it was when they decided on a kind of power sharing agreement, you had three parties really. You had the the, the Shia faction on one side, the Sunnis and the Kurds. And even, you know, to this day, they have a government whereby each of, a representative from each of those factions has to um, occupy a certain role within the government. Um, lots of people say it doesn't work very well. Um, lots of people said at the beginning that it, it favoured the Shia faction. Um, is there something that could be learned from how this was all set up by the Americans and you know, yeah, is, is, is there something that could be learned from that? I cannot uh, talk about that conflict because I honestly don't know much about it. I, I, I have recollections of what happened in Iraq, what I've seen in the news, but I'm not yeah. that well uh, versed in Iraqi politics. But having said that, having said that, the thing is what we need in Yemen is participatory democracy. You cannot just rely on, yes, an initial agreement could be between the main parties, but we will have to call in for elections. The, the government cannot be continuously controlled by the handful of parties. Uh, we need to kind of encourage active citizenship inside the country. Uh, we need local councils elections. We need parliamentary elections so that the people are represented, not the parties. Uh, in the beginning of the conflict, everybody is talking about the GPC the General People's Congress and the Islah Party being the, the vastly two dominant parties. If you go now back to Yemen and ask people which party do you belong to, a lot of people would say, we don't belong to any party. There was a survey that was conducted, uh, uh, was just a year ago, where uh, by the European Institute of Peace, uh, where people were asked, do you feel that you are being represented or are you affiliated with any of the current political parties? 70%, 76% of the population said no. That's a huge number. Mm. And it gives you an indication that people don't no longer trust the current elite who claim to be representing Yemenis. There's this huge disconnect. So in order to have a sustainable peace, an actual democracy, an actual model, that would work better than Syria, Iraq, or whatever, we need it to be a bottom-up uh, democracy where people actually, well, this is what, one of the reasons why we took to the streets in 2011, what, for not being continuously marginalized. We want to have a say in the running of our country. So that, that's a very key point, I think, because clearly in Iraq, sectarianism took over at some point and who's to say that if they didn't have parties who's to say that there aren't a portion of the Shia and Sunni population that support this set of policies and another portion that said support this set of policies and therefore they're politically different even though they've got the same ethnic or religious background I mean in a democracy it doesn't make sense to divide people up by their ethnicity or their exactly this is one of yeah, but this is one of the things, for instance, a lot of people in Yemen, when people are asking me, how bad is sectarianism in Yemen? In Yemen? And I, was, I would be like, I, I was never that prominent for the longest time in my life. Since I was born and raised in Yemen, I never knew and I never cared what religious beliefs my neighbor had. And that's, exactly, that's exactly what Iraqis say, you know, pre 2000 yeah. But certain parties with vested interests wanted to kind of put that splinter, put that divide between Yemenis because it served their purposes to kind of, it's about divide and rule and to antagonize groups and create a phenomena of us versus them. Otherwise, every Yemeni would, would, would not even listen to you. It'd be like, if the Houthis are coming in and saying like, it is us against the non-believers. At, at, at first instance, Yemeni would be like, what non-believers? We're all Muslim. But if you keep repeating that, hmm. 
and you keep showing the other side or painting the other side or demonizing the other side, some people would start listening to you. And you would have indoctrinated a portion of the population that could also become a vehicle for basically brainwashing and indoctrinating others. And if you have control over, for instance, educational curriculums, uh, if you have control of the mosques, if you have control of the radio and TV, you'll start also propagating that narrative and that rhetoric over the waves, over the airwaves, and basically create a generation that is filled or misled, but also filled with a lot of hatred, which is very dangerous. Yes, we did not have those notions and those, those crazy, insane ideas 20 years ago, but we will in the coming 10 to 15. We already have them to a degree, but it's going to get worse of this, this type of propaganda and this hate speech will continue. Which, which are you referring to specifically? On both ends, honestly. The Houthis telling everybody inside Sana'a that the Yemeni government are basically heathens and the Saudis are not the guardians of Mecca and they're, they're, in, cahoots, they're in cahoots with the Jews and with the Americans. They're coming in here to loot our land. They're coming here to kill our children. You can hear, so there's some really insane conspiracy theories by there that are being spun in Sana. And on the other end, you have, of course, the, the Yemeni government and the other side and saying, these are Shiites. They're dirty. They're not real Muslims. We are the Sunnis. We are the followers of the Prophet. So it's, it's like you get to a point where people, especially youth in Yemen, would be like, enough. Enough with this Shia Sunni thing. Everybody's just painting the other in such an ugly image that I don't, I no longer feel that I should be Muslim in the first place. Mm. If there's so much bad in Shia, there's so much bad in Sunni, why should I stay as a Muslim? Yeah. And that's why you've seen a spike in people leaving Yemen and saying, I'm no longer a Muslim, I'm a non-believer. And social media is full of those people. And I, and I personally know some of those activists who did that. Yeah. And so if, let's say, um, a, a, a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire is achieved, mm -hmm. let's say, how do we get to this point where we're discussing these bigger issues about how to order society and how to create some sort of workable state. Well, um, that's the problem we've had over the past. This is not our first per ceasefire, by the way. We've had multiple ceasefires in the past. But that has been the issue. Securing a ceasefire became a goal unto itself. And renewing the ceasefire became the goal. I mean, eyes on the ball. The goal is a peace process, a sustainable peace process, not the ceasefire. Yeah. And because a lot of people were working on an ad hoc basis, they were just focused on getting a ceasefire and renewing it, but not that much interested in making or creating a roadmap for uh, political inclusion or dealing with past injustice, accountability, uh, restorative justice, uh, none of that. So much so that they weren't talking to the right people. They were talking to people at the top because it's easier. So you invite a handful of elites, you talk to them, take a photo and slam that photo up uh, on a press release and just say, we're doing something. and. It's, it's just a never-ending story. And you've been doing that for the past eight years. And if we're being honest, you've been doing that for the past 12 years since the UN got involved in 2011. But again, as I mentioned earlier, what we need is a very, well, bottom-up approach, definitely a bottom-up approach, but also a holistic, 
comprehensive approach, something that ha- that deals with all these layers of the Yemeni conflict, addresses the roots of the conflict, gets buy-in, not from the elites, buy-in from the general masses as well. Hmm. And that, I don't think anything is going to stick. It's not going to stick. And do you think there should be a, an internet, an, an exploration of the international, the role of um, international governments, foreign governments in the conflict? Um, should that be part of any truth and justice, you know, committee or, or talks? I mean, let's be honest. There will never be a time when they're not involved. They will be involved, whether we like it or we don't, one way or the other. Just with Britain, you know, with Britain, for instance, you know, this this is a country that that I'm in at the minute that colonized um, southern Yemen or Mm -hmm. had the port of Aden as its, you know, its its stop-off point for the East India Company for 130 years. it was it was colonized up, up until 1968. We hear no news of what happens in Yemen, even when there was peace talks and prisoner swaps. Barely anything on the BBC. Not interested. They supplied arms to Saudi Arabia throughout the conflict, and and that was you know that was something that the news did occasionally bring up. People in Britain weren't happy about that. Should should they be made to play a role in you know? helping Yemen to recover and um, stabilize itself. Well, the UK is a pen holder at the UN of the Yemen uh, uh, the Yemen conflict, the Yemen peace process. And uh, we wanted a greater role in mediating between the factions, but also in providing aid to Yemenis. Uh, the latter has been cut down, uh, citing multiple uh, reasons by the UK government and uh, to the former we've seen diminishing UK role in Yemen it's as if they do not just drop the ball but seeking an exit strategy I mean I remember there was a point where the UK was seen as championing the, the cause in Yemen but uh, they no longer do I remember when we started noticing this trend and um, I was asked the question, why do you think that is? And I said, one good reason could be is because the the Brits don't want to upset the Saudis. They don't want to step on Saudis toes. So they're like, Saudis can do whatever they want with Yemen. And for the sake of our relationship with the Saudis, we have greater economic interests, military and strategic interests for Saudi, Yemen will be the pound of flesh. We're not getting that much out of Yemen anyway. So they pulled back. Yeah. And and after all, this it seems the Saudis are looking east anyway these days towards China. Well, yeah, but the thing is, it's kind of funny, honestly, to us Yemenis who are watching what's happening, is because the West bent backwards to appease and win over the Saudis. And now, after everything that's done, I remember back at the time, since the beginning of the conflict, we were like, why aren't you condemning the Saudis? Why aren't you putting a stop to this, especially when the Saudis are bombing hospitals, bombing orphanages, and they were committing insane and horrific atrocities inside Yemen. And the West would be like, oh, well, well, it's the Houthis. Oh, well, they're trolling their thumbs. And we're like, we knew that you couldn't, you will never sacrifice your relationship with the Saudis for Yemeni's sakes. But now the Saudis have sacrificed you. Hmm. And they're going east. And they're doing their own thing. And I remember how the Saudis stood uh, vis-a-vis what's happening in Ukraine. And when the West was upset that the Saudis and the UAE as well, didn't adopt a stronger stance along with the Europeans. And we were like, that, that relationship was very transactional. Yeah. And so when the Saudis saw a better deal, they took it. 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, it certainly wasn't based on a shared view of the world or no ideology. Um, and I do wonder if if the Americans will kind of come back into the picture at some stage. Um, of you know, of course, before even two thousand eleven, there was this drone campaign. Um, in response to Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, there was a lot of aid, US aid money going into the country mm. um, for Ali, Abdul- Ali Abdullah Saleh to to stop um, Al Qaeda, but obviously he he was known for playing lots of different sides, spinning lots of different plates, and yes. kind of playing his own game. Um, how did how did that situation with the you know, the rise of um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula take us into the to the Arab Spring and then, then how do we get from there to the war? Well, they're not interlinked. It was one of the drivers of the conflict, but they're not, they don't have that much of an impact. The thing is, the Arab Spring was a region-wide phenomenon. And it's, it's, it's partly driven, yes, by public need for transparency, for democracy, uh, curbing uh, because of the mismanagement of the state affairs, and also uh, curbing of corruption. But it was also driven by political parties who basically wanted to get rid of their opponents. This is one of the reasons why, as soon as it started, the Arabs being in Yemen, Saleh's opposition quickly joined the change square. Why the Houthis joined the change square? Why even Saleh's second in command, Ali Mohsen, changed the change square? Because he, he was like, you know what? This is my opportunity to topple Saleh. And basically, this is going to be my next 30 years of rule, as Saleh had it in the past. But they miscalculated. And I remember. I used to do uh, interviews from Chain Square while we were very independent activists, while we were very excited in the beginning and people were like, it's not about just removing Saleh. We have nothing against the man personally. It's about his management. It's about the this whole structure inside the country, corruption and what have you. Mm-hmm. We wanted the change of the regime. And I remember within the first few weeks, it was all fine. We had dreams, we had aspirations. But quickly, I saw the regime's leaders, the corrupt regime leaders next to my tent. The guy that I was like, I I, I actually criticized for stealing massive amounts of public funding. He's here next to me and he's like, yes, down with the regime. And I'm like, what the hell? What are you doing here? But quickly, the, the, the uprising was hijacked by the very same corrupt politicians and political parties. So they saw which way the wind was blowing and kind of joined the opposition. They erode that wave, exactly. Yeah. And suddenly, Wasala and these parties signing an agreement, reboxing the regime, while everybody else was completely out of the picture and thrown out of the picture. And you've seen the results of that. We had the National Dialogue Conference, which did not amount to anything. We had, I believe it was something like 1,800 recommendations that it was implemented. And the results, the outcomes were not binding. And of course, because of it, we had a fallout, especially in terms of the division of the country into whether it be a federal system or a, a centralized system and uh, a Republican system. And the Houthis moved into Sana. So basically, they were like, you know what? The government is weak. Saleh, of course, partnered with them. They like the GMP, the joint meeting of political parties was the opposition. And the JMP, basically, we could kick them out of the country, even though we signed the, the GCC agreement. And they did that. 
near end of 2014. By 2015, when they chased out the government all the way to Aden and also out of Aden, the Saudis were like, you know what? This has this whole thing has been done our, under our own auspices. So we need to step in. And convinced by Yemeni military generals, they thought they would have an easy win. But also the Saudis had their own vested interests because the Saudis needed to quell the rebellion in the south, south of the border, but also they had their own internal reasons. They had their own internal dynamics, and it always helps to have an external war to unify internal ranks, always helps to force this rise through the ranks as a, a war champion. Mm -hmm. And they did it. There was multiple reasons for that. They did it. And we were caught in that storm. Yemenis, I mean, when I say we, like average Yemenis like myself, we were caught in, 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 in that storm. And we paid the heaviest price. Yeah. And, the, you know, before the conflict had even started, Yemen was the poorest country in the Middle East, certainly yeah. had already had quite a few issues in terms of water shortages and, yes. um, and other yeah. things which really haven't been away. Um, so... My, my final question, um, it's been a great discussion, we've covered a lot of topics, but my final question would be, if, if we start, if, if a peace process is established, what's the, what's the first thing that should be done, in your view? What, where do we start? That's a very excellent question. People have reached this level of fatigue where they don't trust in the peace process anymore. You can preach and parade the peace process however you want and spin it on a thousand axes. But without local buy-in, you won't get far. What the international community needs to know, what the UN needs to know, is that you can have all your little meetings, you can have all your photo ops, but without a bottom-up approach, without bringing in Yemenis into the process, it will not be sustainable. First of all, it's going to be a skewed process based on the wrong kind of input. You need to ask Yemenis directly what they want in terms of the in, in terms of demands of the shape or the framework of the peace process. To a lot of Yemenis, for instance, before anything, they want improvement in basic services, livelihoods, security, protections from human rights from human rights violations. Those are the basics. They need peace dividends. Once you have that in place, once people can sit down and think straight, they will help you in building some sort of a roadmap for the peace process. They will be able to tell you, if you want peace in Taz, you need, for instance, to remove all the militias outside the city. You need to fix the water shortage issues that you just mentioned. Because that's, that's one of the reasons of the conflict. You need to fix the roads, to improve roads, because fixing of roads and lifting the siege will improve livelihoods. It will restart the economy. Once you have that in place, people will move beyond that. The fighters will return from the fighting fronts and start picking up jobs, looking after their own families. There's going to be a de-escalation. There's going to be less animosity. Then they'll be more likely to engage politically. There needs to be a, res a restoration of relationships between Yemenis. There needs to be, again, you mentioned uh, truth committees, you mentioned earlier some, some kind of processes that need to be set in place. That kind of discussion would be had by that time. But without all of that, we're not gonna get far. And as I said earlier in the, in the beginning, what we need I know it sounds simplistic when I keep repeating it, but in all honesty, we need a very holistic and comprehensive process that addresses the roots of the conflict, but also the multi-layered uh, war in Yemen. And I think that's a pretty good place to end it. Um, and Hisham, thanks very much for coming on to the Memo in Conversation with podcast. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for having me. I hope we can get to this this process soon and 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 start 
and stop the Likewise. stop the suffering. Likewise. Well, thank you, Alex. It's been fun. This was Middle East Monitor Conversations, brought to you by the Middle East Monitor in London. <laughs>